Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel once again. This is World War II Books Where to Start. And I am your host, Otto von Bismarck. And don't you forget it. Today we'd like to do some end of your stuff. And we're going to do a top five worst books I read this year in World War II. Now as I mentioned, my top five best. I read about 65 or 68 books this year. And other World War II stuff I read uh, probably comprises 40-50% of my total reading for the year. And these are the stinkers that I was unfortunate enough to run across and plow through. So this is kind of a warning video. Uh, if you run across these things and think about them, I'm going to try to send you screaming into the night the other way and save you the agony that I went through. So five being the least awfulest and number one being the most awfulest. Here we go. Number five, Lost Horizon by James Hilton. 1933. I covered this extensively in another video about novels. So we'll just make this kind of brief. This is built as a utopian novel, more of a lost generation novel to me, concerning a group of American and British uh, civilians stranded in a war-ravaged city in China that are hijacked by a mysterious pilot on a passenger plane, taken to a high Himalayas uh, plateau with a uh, monastery built out of time and out of place. They crash land there and they're stuck with these uh, kind of weird monks and they talk to each other incessantly and do nothing else but are for about 150 pages or so real GND and stuff with indis indistinguishable characters meaningless conversations um, I, I, I cannot recommend this on any level it is so bad and it probably survives just because of the connection to Doolittle's rate of 42 where the Shangri-La uh, thing was mentioned by FDR, or else it would not be in print today. But it's simply not worthwhile. <laughs> Number four. Here's an SS memoir by uh, a guy named Arifin Bartman, published in 2013. It might be a reissue there. Some of these SS memoirs date from earlier days, but uh, they didn't get reprinted later on. But the publication date I have is 2013. This has a four-and-a-half star rating on 937 reviews on Goodreads. And I can't understand this. This is half a star, a quarter of a star, a tenth of a star material. It's, the title is Fur Folk und Führer by Erwin Bartmann. He was an SS butt private in the Leibstein Archer Division. Uh, and his, you know, recounting of his uh, war on the Eastern Front. He made it through the first two winters and had to be kind of invalided out uh, because of frostbite severe frostbite in his legs and so he spent most of the rest of the war being more more or less a garrison soldier in the Berlin area carousing and, and drinking and just screwing off uh, he did get uh, jerked back into the war for the last ditch defense of Berlin on the Oder front in, in May of or April of 45 but uh, you know it, it, it's a really sanitized SS experience Really, really squeaky clean, like hospital disinfected clean. You would never know there were any dirty shenanigans on the Eastern Front whatsoever after after having re read this. He, he uh, will will tell you that they behaved honorably and they fought cleanly, and it was just the dirty Russians that played nasty and did and did uh, despicable things to German troops. The Russians are the ones that commit atrocities against Germans. The Leibstand are to always behave themselves properly. Now the SD guys that came in behind them. They had a bad reputation, but the frontline soldiers, we played it clean, man. We were there for the honor of the Reich, and we're fighting Bolshevism to save the world. It's all garbage. There's no, there's no mention of the political indoctrination that the SS, uh, Waffen SS, went through uh, before being deployed to the Eastern Front. There's no mention of the Commissar Order. There's no mention of, um, hey, I saw a group of Jews being shot today. I wonder what that's all about. Or, hey, we were detailed to do some anti-partisan operations. Uh, got to kill these guys. They're all commissars. Uh, or that's what they tell us, and we're going to shoot them down. War stuff. There's none of that. It's all clean as a whistle stuff. Uh, utterly unbelievable that uh, he didn't see or hear a thing that was untoward or against the rules, whatever. But it, it's even worse when we get to that spring of 45, and uh, he's got a ragtag unit, and he's commanding... Uh, against the Russians, and they quickly get pummeled out of their positions and the water behind the lines and descends into fantasy land uh, stuff. 
uh, is completely unbelievable to the point of like soft porn as a fantasy at, at times. It's just utterly ridiculous that you would think this actually happened. But he, he reports that you know, it's more concerned with his sexual fantasies than, you know, saying, well, I was huddled in a ditch for three days while it rained on me. It's probably what really happened. Said so this weird, uh, uh, you know, it's 1980s Playboy kind of uh, soft porn uh, production he's he's going to tell you about. And then uh, you know, he gets captured at the end of the war. He gets sent to Great Britain as a POW working in a coal mine. I think it was a coal mine. Even that's pretty, like, uh, bland and nondescript. He can't even summon up, summon up any energy to, to tell you about uh, how he resented He had to resent that, but it's, nah, 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 that was POW. No big deal. And then I, he settled in Scotland, I think it was, or, or Ireland after the war. I lived out his days there. This is, uh, this is just utterly, utterly unbelievable. There's uh, so much space between the lines that you can see you know, what he's not saying is the real truth. I suppose what he is saying is just about complete garbage. And uh, it's probably turned out to make a buck in his old age to secure his, uh, his uh, late life you know, lifestyle. But uh, as valuable memoir history, no, no, this is trash. It's really bad. If you're full Fuhrer, run the other way. There are plenty of SS memoirs out there. There's got to be some better ones than this. Number three, Faithful Choices by Ian Kershaw from 2007. And I was bitterly disappointed after having plowed through this on audio for 27 and a half hours. This is bad. I expected a lot more out of Kershaw. I've read a great bio of Hitler, two-volume bio of Hitler by him that I thought was really, really fantastic. And I expected you know, more of the same kind of scholarship and writing ability here. And what I got was... Uh, just pure drudgery. He's going to talk about 10 faithful decisions that made or bro uh, broke World War II or, or may, uh, had it turn out as it did. And you think, so these, these are really the, the, the hinging points that, uh, that need consideration above all others. And they're all pretty dull. Uh, I only got a value out of two of those, and that would be the uh, British Peace Peelers in the summer of 40 and Mussolini's decision to declare war. Those were only two of the, the only the, the only two of the ten that I thought had any spark or life in them. Excuse me, or presented any kind of any kind of interesting dilemma. The other eight are just like I mean, come on, you know, Japan's decision to enter the war is not it's not faithful decision. It's what they wanted to do. They were going to go to war one way or the other. It's just it was just a matter of timing. It wasn't whether whether they were going to do it. It was a matter of when they did it. That's pretty clear from the historical record. And to make some extra drama out of this is unsupportable. And not only that, the writing is, is just pure awful. Every topic is bloated. And uh, I, I could easily cut 200 pages off this book to condense it. It wouldn't make the material any better, I don't think. But it might be slightly more bearable. Uh, sometimes, uh, when I think back on this, I wonder if he actually wrote this himself or whether this is just presented as an Ian Kershaw book but it was actually penned by someone else. It's that that awful. It does not read like Ian Kershaw at all. So I have my doubts about, about it. And it's not entirely unknown in the publishing industry to have something that's ghostwritten put out under a famous author's name. Hopefully rare in nonfiction and fiction, but I am not entirely convinced this is actually a Kershaw book. But be that as it may, as faithful choices, and I would say make your own faithful choice and avoid it. Number two, Unit 731. This has a long sub subtitle. Unit 731 Testimony, Japan's Wartime Human Experiment Program, <laughs> by a certain Hal Gold, published in 06. I don't know how gold is, what his credentials are. There's not really anything on, on the Goodreads page for, for uh, author bio. But this is really bad. Uh, this is a, a two-parter. Uh, we've got part one, which will cover the unit itself, who its principal members were, where they were, where they were stationed, and kind of a, a rough idea of what they did, what that unit did during the war. With anthrax, smallpox, Trying to blight crops, um, infect people with uh, with smallpox, and spread spread it throughout the Chinese population, and do some 
airborne drops of, of disease, you know, disease to try to spread uh, plague that way, along with the human uh, vivisection that was performed by the uh, unit's surgeons at many points during the war, oftentimes with select audiences of uh, medical researchers and doctors from them Japan from Japan to, to witness this as some kind of advance in, in, in medical science. Uh, we have a section performed without any anesthetic whatsoever. Um, these poor victims, uh, it's, it's unimaginable to have this happen to you. But the uh, Unit 731 did it over and over again um, with, without any rationale whatsoever you, you could discern. Somehow how gold makes us all pretty much dull as dishwater and it's hard to discern there's any uh, real horror story going on here. He's, he's that bad of a, a presenter. Part two is straight testimony, a verbatim transcripts from a spoken word tour made by the perpetrators of uh, Unit 731 members that were still living in the 80s or 90s, 80s or 90s, a tour Japan as kind of a... Um, Introduction to Japanese audiences about what Unit 731 was during the war and what they did. So night after night, these uh, perpetrators went on stage and told their stories about, I was here and I did this and I did that. And then uh, this is just verbatim transcript of their live performances, if you will. Kind of run together mush. It doesn't make much impression on you as a reader. If you were there watching it with a translator in you know, live to, to see, yeah, I killed this guy in this way and I felt nothing, that might make an impression on you. But to read it as a straight uh, recitation of what someone, you know, what they said on stage is absolutely worthless. It does nothing for you. You're not going to retain any of these stories. Even though some are pretty yuck, yuck, uh, nasty stuff, you're not going to retain any of these stories six months later, two months later, two weeks later. I certainly didn't. So that's Unit 731 by Hal Gold. Not worth your time. And number one stinker of the year. Uh, blitzed. Drugs in Germany. By a certain Norman Oller, published in 2015. Wow. Here we go straight into pure revisionist uh, crypto-Nazi territory. This guy wants to blame Hitler's actions on his drug use. Trying to argue, not so subtly, that he was just not in his right mind. And things would have been far different if he been sober and clear-headed. He's going to pin the tail on the donkey of his uh, personal quack, Theo Morell. Hitler had a number of doctors throughout the years. He had his own personal surgeon. He had, you know, had his own specialist dentist. And, and uh, you know, had his larynx operate on some, for polyps late in the war by a different surgeon. So he went through a share of medical people, as, you know, as world leaders do. They have a you know, wide variety of staff on hand. But Theo Morell was the quack of the bunch for Hitler's group. And... Um, he was a pill pusher and injection guy. He liked to do these vitamin injections and, and weird solutions that he, you know, kind of like holistic homeopathy today. And do these injections and you'll feel better. And Hitler's primary complaint in the 30s was, was his stomach. He had, had chronic indigestion and stomach pain issues. And Theo Morell was discovered by, I think, his personal photographer, Hoffman, and talented to Hitler as a guy who's going to solve all this. And Hitler kind of took him on. And do you feel better, then you feel worse. And you feel better, then you feel worse. And Morel was always on hand to give him an injection or give him a pill. And uh, you know, keep, him, keep, him, keep his mind going. You know, hypochondriac kind of thing. And Norman Oller is going to twist this into... Uh, he was feeding him morphine and cocaine. And keeping Hitler doped up to the eyeballs. And that's why he did the things he did. And the whole war would have been a lot different if Hitler hadn't been, uh, you know, uh, medicated by Morel. It's trash. It's, it's posed as a uh, general history of drugs in the Third Reich, but it's really a disguised mini-bio of Hitler through the lens of his quack physician, Theo Morel. It, it's just, uh, I'm really a crypto-Nazi, and I want everybody to know I'm a crypto without saying I'm a crypto myself. But here's my story to try to, to get you a nudge, judge, wink, wink, kind of how Monty Python kind of stuff. And it's hard to believe that this got through the publication and vetting process in, in 2016. It's, it's hard to believe that any publisher took this seriously and thought, yes, yeah, it's a good idea to put this one out. It, it, it's, 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 a, it's grossly irresponsible to pose this as a history. This should have been an underground press you know, put out on the internet, 
kind of like the old anarchist cookbook was. It's that bad and, and has no place in, in historical writing. It's not history. It's revisionist crap. That is Blitz by Norman Oler. So that's my top five worst stinkers for the year. We started with Lost Horizon by James Hilton, and that's kind of mild, the mildest of the bunch. It's just a bad novel compared to what I just said about uh, Blitz and any of 731. But anyway, Lost Horizon and Fur Folk and Fuhrer by Erevin Bartman, the SS memoir. Go, go far away from that. Number three, Faithful Choices. It's good if you need a sleeping pill. And don't have a sleeping pill, you can just read that, and it'll put your lights out right away. Unit 731, Testimony by Hal Gold. Bad, bad, bad. And Blitz by Norman Oller. Really awful. That's my top five words for 2021, or as I like to call it, year two of COVID. So stick around for the channel. Do, do me some likes and comments, man, and we'll come back at you again soon with another vid. Thanks for watching.